Good day, everybody, and welcome to the webinar, a part of the Transformation Webinar Series. And uh, Steve Waddell will be our host today. I'm David Oram, uh, hosting from Montreal Hub of Future Earth. Uh, welcome, everybody, and we'll pass it over to Steve to begin the webinar. Thanks. Thanks so much, David. Um, I'm your host. This has been hosted by the SDG Transformation Forum. And we're looking at the issue of funding today. And there are a couple of uh, distinct issues of funding with the transformation uh, issue and the SDGs. Um, one of them is that the funders themselves have their own challenges. Um, it's not simply we want money and give us money, please. It's about how do the funders uh, work in this arena of uh, getting money and building the infrastructure because they've got their own transformation challenge about how uh, to mobilize capital as well as provide it. So this is what the um, one aspect the webinar is focused on today. Um, another aspect is simply, of course, uh, familiarizing ourselves with what they are uh, have already mobilized but uh, so keep in mind that they have their own uh, transformation challenges uh, we have three great uh, presenters today uh, we have uh, benjamin belleggi who's with wings the worldwide initiative for grant makers support uh, in uh, sao paulo i believe you are uh, no benjamin today and yes. we have uh, marco netto who is not uh, online in terms of the uh, webcams today because he also happens to be in uh, Brazil today, but he's uh, got bandwidth issues. So rather than um, stretch the bandwidth, uh, we thought that um, he would uh, not use his webcam. And he's with, uh, with the UNDP. He's been working with the uh, SDG Philanthropic Forum to develop that with uh, a large number of foundations. He'll tell us about that. And we have Erica Key, who, Erica, you're, for some reason, I think you're in Illinois somewhere. Is that, is that right? I'm um, in New Orleans. Or somewhere. New Orleans. Oh, New Orleans. Storm storm okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and Erica is the executive director for uh, the Belmont Forum, which is an initiative that is bringing together scientific funders and others um, that does support Future Earth um, and uh, other uh, initiatives as well. So uh, we, we're going to investigate these issues, first of all, with uh, Benjamin. Uh, Benjamin, if you can tell us something about WINGS and what you're doing uh, to develop this, uh, this financing infrastructure for transformation. Thanks so much. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Steve, for inviting us to speak on this important issue. Very briefly, WINGS is the global network that gathers the different organizations that support the development of philanthropy worldwide. So we have members in 40 countries, and these members are either national associations of foundations, support organizations, some uh, academic and research centers focusing on philanthropy, support organizations. So any, any, any structure that helps philanthropy to be more efficient, to have an enabling environment to, to be able to operate in the best conditions and to, and to develop the, and with the final goal, of course, of supporting civil society and, and social change. Um, so the, the question is a very, very complex and very, wide question uh, so just just as a reminder i think that the the estimated number the estimated amount to to fund the sdgs is 3.5 trillion dollars per year uh, which is of course an amount that either the bilateral or multilateral agency cannot uh, cover alone so that's very naturally that the the question of how to tap in the potential of philanthropy and and private resources for for development and for public good uh, uh, is is uh, is crucial uh, um, and there is indeed an unleashed potential but uh, as a start in this conversation i want also to emphasize on the fact that uh, 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 the amounts of the volumes of, of funding that are available in the philanthropic sector, uh, even if they have to be and they can be developed, and I'm going to talk about that, uh, are never going to fill entirely this gap. Uh, so I think that we should look at the transformation not only in terms of pure volumes, 
but also in more in qualitative ways on the way that uh, philanthropy uh, can contribute to the development fabric uh, in a qualitative manner by bringing actors together and by helping to shift uh, the development aid uh, the aid development paradigm uh, so, uh, because I think that's how we can really talk about transformation through through financing. Um, so, I, I would say that to finance the transformation that we're talking about, we need to transform the financing. And uh, 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 why do we need to transform the financing? I think that there is there is really a need to change the paradigm of uh, development aid uh, uh, and calling because we had the discussion around the SDGs around the last uh, uh, humanitarian World Humanitarian Summit and the recent debates in the NGO sector at the international level. Uh, and we see that there is a need to have more space for uh, business and for new actors like philanthropy and business, but we also need to have more space for collaboration, intersectoral collaboration between the different kinds of actors. And uh, Marcos Neto will talk about that for sure. But also there is a need for more relocalization of aid and of the development, which means supporting more directly local civil societies. But one of the aspects that we are uh, not always including in this reflection is that we also need to develop local private resources and, and domestic philanthropy to sustain these local uh, civil societies to, to, uh, to address the, the pressing issues of our, of our time. Um, and so uh, uh, how, how to transform this, this financing system from a philanthropy perspective? Uh, th there are two points I will, I will mention very briefly and I will insist on the third one more in depth. One, of course, is to innovate because, well, in the philanthropic sectors, there is a lot of variety and there are a lot of innovations. And so uh, in terms of uh, uh, public and private partnerships or new ways to invest on uh, through venture philanthropy and other types of, of private investment for social good, uh, uh, different types of uh, strategic philanthropy approaches that are a way that can bring this, this new this transformation in the way that uh, the funding goes to support the, the transformation on the ground. Uh, second, the second uh, dimension I want to, to, to emphasize on is the, the need to transform the, the approach itself uh, in funding civil society, in funding NGOs, in funding uh, projects uh, with an increased trust in local civil societies, with more flexibility and, uh, as I already mentioned, with a better articulation uh, also with government and, and other actors. Um, but the main point on which I wanted to insist uh, is the need, and that's what you were referring to, Steve, in the introduction, is the need to develop domestic philanthropy, especially in the in domestic, in uh, emerging market and in the global south. Uh, um, and so uh, this is this is something that needs to be done in, in different ways. But first of all, why is it necessary? First, because uh, uh, there is a need to provide long term support to uh, and long term resources for uh, civil society and to move beyond the project approaches uh, that are that are now the norm in, in the in the development field. So we need to have also local actors that provide long term resources. Uh, the second aspect is that we need uh, to counter the negative narratives on foreign funding, which is growing in many regions of the world, in many countries. Uh, uh, there is there is uh, uh, an increasing pressure on international uh, uh, aid uh, and funding, uh, including from foundations. And so developing domestic resources, domestic philanthropy and helping local philanthropists to develop their work and their resources uh, is, a, is a, a very interesting way to counter this negative narrative and to address this issue of a shrinking space for civil society. Uh, and the third uh, reason is, uh, is the necessity to have more local ownership in the development processes. Uh, uh, especially, and this is uh, especially possible when we come to approaches such as community philanthropy that builds on local assets, not only financial assets, but also in kind and other types of assets that lie in the community and in the in, and around the communities themselves. So that's that's another a very important reason uh, because it's probably one of the main critics towards the question of of how we implement the development agenda is is the question of the ownership of populations. So um, so for the three reasons that the domestic the development of domestic philanthropy of local private resources uh, are a very important an, an answer to that. Um, so this domestic philanthropy is already there. Uh, of course, you have all the traditions of giving, all the tr cultures of giving. Uh, just to name one, the, the zakat, for example, in the Muslim world, uh, allows to raise about thirty billion dollars per year, and so there are 
conversations and I think recently the UNHCR has managed to uh, convince some of the religious leaders that uh, they, they could orient some of these uh, these resources towards the refugee crisis for example which so it's a it's one of the examples of how to tap in this potential of, of domestic philanthropy in the in the broad sense of the term but there are of course a, a, a high number of, of and a growing number of high net worth individuals in the in emerging markets in particular and we see that new important foundations are being created such as for example the project of the Azim Premji uh, Foundation and Philanthropic Initiatives in India and of course there is a, a middle class that is growing very fastly and that has the resources that are not yet maybe fully uh, uh, used and available for, for funding and supporting the social change and the transformation that we are we're seeking through the, the 2013 agenda. Uh, but this very uh, important uh, potential uh, uh, st still needs to be developed both in terms of volumes and also in terms of efficiency and of, uh, of quality in a way, uh, how, to, how to use all these resources more efficiently and how to grow these resources because we know that a lot could be, uh, a lot more could be done to support the, the, the agenda. And, and so that's where, and that's where I want to insist and where I will conclude, it's the question of how we build the ecosystem and the infrastructure that help philanthropy to, to grow and to thrive and to play fully its role in, in addressing these issues. And, um, and we have found out that despite the very high, fast growth of economies and fast growth of philanthropy in, in, uh, in many regions, there is a big gap in terms of infrastructure, in terms of ecosystem, which are all these organizations I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation that create the conditions for philanthropy to, to develop and to be efficient. Uh, there is a big gap. And for example, in the last report that Wings has published this year, we saw that 80% of the expenditures of all the amounts that are invested in philanthropy uh, ecosystem are spent in North America and only 5% are spent in Asia or in the MENA region altogether. So that shows that there is a very important need to invest in these uh, ecosystems to strengthen domestic philanthropy. Um, and so uh, I, I will not detail now, I think I'm going to be over time otherwise uh, uh, exactly uh, what are the different functions because I'm happy to discuss with the audience afterwards. But very briefly, I mentioned the National Association of Foundations, research centers and others. What can they do? They can advocate uh, to have tax incentives. They can advocate to have a better environment to be able to operate. Uh, they can strengthen and train philanthropies to be to invest more, more strategic, strategically their resources and so on. So that's why we believe that it's absolutely crucial for uh, development funders, whether they are foundations or they are multilateral agency or they are other kinds of funders of development, it is crucial that they invest in the philanthropy infrastructure in the countries and in the regions where they are uh, implementing their, their, uh, their agenda and their projects to achieve the sustainable development goals. Uh, and uh, this is valuable both for civil society and for philanthropy infrastructure. We need, we need to include that uh, uh, more organically and more transversely in all the development uh, uh, approaches, I think, for, for funders. And uh, WINGS is, of course, involved in, uh, in helping this to happen. And I'm happy to discuss with you a bit more on, on what we can do uh, to go in this direction. Thank you. Thanks so much, Benjamin. Um, very helpful. Um, so I want to just point out that the SDG Transformation Forum uh, aspires to work with people like Benjamin and the other uh, lead discussants we have today to be able to support their uh, aspirations for the transformations they're working for. So uh, if you have any ideas about how we might do that or how you might do that, that you might like to explore, um, I'd invite you to put them in the question box but of course you can put in questions as well and we can uh, develop some collaborations for instance uh, Benjamin's uh, laid out a, 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 a strategy uh, for building this capacity which requires research requires some interventions um, and activities that would be done could be done collaboratively between uh, the various um, stakeholders in the SDG transformation forum community so thanks so much, Benjamin. I'm going to uh, turn off your webcam now, and we're going to uh, go to um, Marcos Neto. And Marcos, as I explained, does not have a sufficient bandwidth for 
actually uh, doing the uh, putting coming on webcam, but Marcos is with the UNDP and he's been taking leadership in developing the SDG transformation forum. So, uh, Marcos, uh, tell us something about what you've been doing and what your uh, challenges are, and if you have any sort of thoughts to add about how the SDG transformation forum as a community might help uh, you with your own uh, challenges here, uh, feel free to make suggestions. Thank you so much, Marcos. Thank you, everybody. I hope uh, you can hear me well. Um, and apologies for not being uh, visible. Um, but um, I'm on a holidays in a hotel outside Rio and not with a lot of bandwidth. Let me just start by framing a little bit here what are the challenges you know that we have and, and some of the jargons that you've heard in the last uh, two years you know um, things like from billions to trillions um, and from funding to financing um, i think the second one from funding funding to financing has to be particularly important you know um, our colleagues at UNCTAD have actually put a price tag of five trillion us dollars every year uh, until 2030 for the SDGs to be, the cost of the SDGs to be implemented. We know that there is a gap of about $2.5 trillion. And last year, we had the highest uh, year for, for international aid ever, and that was about $168 billion. So international aid, while relevant, it's a drop in the bucket in terms of financing the SDGs. Now, where is this going to come from? You know, I think, one, it's very important that the SDGs, the SDGs are not going to be won or lost or implemented, you know, at global level. They're going to be implemented at the country level, right? You know, it's going to be... ...domestic uh, uh, development plans and the domestic policies uh, and in the domestic financing that will make the SDGs viable. Um, some of that can happen easily in large emerging countries, things like, uh, you know, the country that I'm sitting right now where I come from, Brazil or China or India. But the problem for uh, low mid income countries or uh, least developing countries um, and uh, small island states, uh, fragile countries, it, it, it's one that even with uh, increase in domestic resource mobilization for the SDGs will be very difficult to fill in. So that brings us to, you know, the need for private capital. There is no doubt about it that for the SDGs to be fully uh, financed, we are going to have to to to, to have a, a large of uh, private capital in financing development. Um, I think philanthropy and, and, and Benjamin talked about it um, has a role in it, you know, but again, north south philanthropic flows, right, if I'm not mistaken, it's about $65 billion. So it's still a lot to grow. And I completely agree with Benjamin that the need to grow of uh, southern philanthropy um, is very important. And to have southern philanthropic organizations playing a role either by being grant makers or as most most the case in the emerging markets being operational foundations themselves is very is very important but again it's not enough right we actually have to make the sdgs attractive to mainstream uh, uh private capital you know we have to bring corporate corporate money not corporate social responsibility but the big budgets of corporations into it you know and we have to bring it you know sovereign funds and we have to bring it capital market into it now the first big challenge in doing that is the short-term nature of capital markets right and unless we are able to break the bottleneck of quarterly reporting and quarterly financial projections and you know senior business leaders own compensation tied up to short-term nature of capital it will be very difficult to mobilize the kinds of resources that we needed. The second thing that I think is very important is to highlight and to demonstrate and to show, right, the business models that corporations can put it in place, that they are profitable, but they are environmentally sound and, 
right? They include the base of the pyramid, right? Into uh, uh, the, the core business strategies in operation, therefore lifting people out of poverty. At UNDP, we call these inclusive business models, right? It's uh, uh, very, very important that we see a growth and a scaling up of those business models. And we have plenty of examples. We actually run out of my office um, an alliance, a global alliance called the Business Call to Action. Uh, we have 193 companies from all sizes from all over the world that have made inclusive business commitments and are actually demonstrating that it is profitable while environmentally sound and including the base of the pyramids as suppliers or consumers of core business operations in that sense. The good news is that the um, SDGs, they actually offer a financial return to private capital. You know, the SDGs, you know, um, in January this year at Davos, the, the Business and Sustainable Commission, the Business uh, Commission for Sustainable Development launched a report called Better, Better Business, Better World, or the other way around, I can't remember right now, in which they actually put, you know, a tag of 12 trillion US dollars to the unleash of economic growth, right, within the SDGs for the corporations, for the companies, for the investors that bring the SDGs into the core business. They actually further broke down uh, uh, on how to do this. They identified what is um, 60 hotspots, that's the terminology, where investment and in, in business models can be developed um, and unleash this $12 trillion in that sense. So all in all, you have a picture that, you know, we need to move from funding to financing the SDGs. In that sense, the use of aid and the use of philanthropic funds to leverage private investment becomes a strategy that we've all been talking for decades, but it's now really time to make it happen. Um, it's also very important to recognize that for this to happen, we actually need to build trust among societies. And that's something that we are trying to do a lot uh, around the world, which is to, to create you know, what we call a UNDP multi-stakeholder platforms, like the SDG philanthropy platform that we've launched three years ago that uh, both Steve and Benjamin referred to, uh, but also doing other ones with the private sector. We have one in Kenya now, the UN is brokering, uh, dedicated to SDG 3 with the private sector and government. And those platforms are very important because they allow uh, um, players, you know, civil society, business, philanthropy, and government to come together, right, around, under the umbrella of the SDGs, to one, you know, know what governments are planning and how governments are nationalizing and bringing the SDGs into their national plans, and two, um, what are the gaps and what are the needs and more important, what are the opportunities, right, that the SDGs are offering at the national level, and I think third, and most important, to identify alignment, to identify collective action, right? At bare minimum, we have to make sure that all dollars that get to be invested in the SDGs, private or public, are not wasted, are not duplicated each other. The only way you can do that is to make sure that players are aware of, of, of what others are doing it. They are allowed to make their own decisions as a foundation, as a business investment, but are aware that their decisions are linked to a larger ecosystem, to a larger plan, and how does those things align uh, in that sense. And I think in the end, to generate collective action, right? Uh, collective action doesn't not necessarily mean that, you know, Foundation A gives money to UNDP, but at least that we are all kind of in the same boat, rowing towards the same destination, uh, you know, and, the, and that destination is the SDG, the SDGs. A last important point on this, which we are also working on, is all of that has to be properly measured. If we are going to use public resources or aid or philanthropic resources to leverage private capital, we have to be able to demonstrate that we are not unduly subsidizing business, that we are actually you know, delivering the social and environmental returns right, rather than just the profitability. Otherwise, you know, we know that this, this, you know, has been plenty of blue washes or green washes and elements in the past. So a more robust, you know, impact that social impact measurement of of core business operation is going to be essential 
to generate the necessary trust and credibility, right? That those alignments are actually delivering all that is being promised in that sense. At UNDP, we are launching both a service offer to all governors and, and our offices in the world on how to set up those multi stakeholder platforms, very much based on our experience of the SDG philanthropy platform. Um, we are actually also expanding our social impact measurement for business, you know, so we can you know, provide that robust uh, uh, accountability mechanism, if you want, that this is not a blue wash, but rather you know, uh, a, a valuable effort to align all capitals so we can actually reach the trillions necessary and move from funding discrete projects to a financing of an overall plan right towards the SDGs. Um, and um, we have a website, you know, um, several actually, that um, you, 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 the audience can look at or can get in touch with me later on. Um, and, and we really are very thankful to Steve, to Future Earth, to put this together because, you know, we just had, uh, um, we are just coming into the second high level political forum in New York. Um, and um, the Secretary General just issued the second annual report on progress of the SDGs. And, and if things don't pick up, right, um, considerably from where the last, the first two years have been, you know, we are not going to get to implement the SDGs. So I think it's very important that we bring every ply together. Now, Steve, just to finalize, in terms of what the SDG Transformation Network, I actually think that, you know, is this message of alignment, is this message of, you know, uh, pe perhaps sometimes deferring to every, to what an individual philanthropy uh, uh, or what an individual investment you know, decision is towards a collective action exercise. You know, how do we demonstrate to people that sometimes pulling your resources, you know, uh, either directly or through an alignment process, you know, um, with governments, uh, having civil society vouch for this, it's going to be essential to mobilize uh, all the energy and the resources necessary for it. So whatever you can do in terms of the measurement science, the, the system thinking approaches, you know, the collectiveness of bringing people together, we are very much interested to have that support and to work with anybody on this. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll end it here and hopefully we can have a dialogue later on. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks so much, uh, Marcos. Um, great uh, to hear all of this system from uh, funding to uh, financing, a, a nice short way to summarize it. Uh, we're now going to move on to um, Erica, who is Erica Key, who's with the um, Belmont Forum. And Erica has uh, been involved in the development of the Belmont Forum strategy, of course, as executive director. And uh, she's going to tell us something about that and the way that they're approaching uh, these needs for financing the types of activities that um, are represented by Future Earth and others. Um, Erica, would you like to join us uh, and? Uh, you can have uh, control of the um, slides so that you can present your slides, which I understand you have some of as well. Yes, thank you, Steve. Uh, can you see the slides? No, not yet. Okay. Let's see. David, can you help us out here? There we are. Okay, great. Okay, we can have Thank you. Here. Great. Thank you so much, Steve, and to Future Earth for this invitation today. <clears throat> My name is Erica Key. I'm the Executive Director of the Belmont Forum. And I want to provide a short background about the forum and then talk more about the challenges that we interpret as opportunities in the funding of the SDGs and other relevant sciences. So the forum itself is a partnership of funding organizations, um, a funding framework that is flexible enough to gather together uh, a variety 
of funders from private, public, uh, various levels of governance, um, basically anyone with resources, whether they're monetary or in kind, to be able to apply to an area of common interest. So we count over 25 organizations as members representing more than 50 countries and six global partners that uh, help us leverage activity without duplication. <clears throat> so just to speak about our audience, um, where we implement uh, the Belmont Challenge, which is really bringing together a consortium of partners from natural sciences, social sciences, and stakeholders, but broadening uh, ever more from that uh, perspective to be able to realize both fundamental and applied solutions to areas of critical need and um, develop a plan for not only understanding but mitigating and adapt to, uh, adapting to global change. So one of the issues as we've heard is um, the amount of activity that's ongoing um, sort of in parallel by a number of actors and the forum seeks to bring together those actors in these project consortia. And we've been successful in bringing together expertise from a variety of perspectives. So uh, the conversation moves outside of academia or outside of a um, purely um, development or um, small business or industrial perspective. So we bring the museum, natural research institutions, mixed units, public-private partnerships, industry, even the military together with tribal governments and policymakers, UN organizations and workers unions. I mean, it's really stakeholder writ large here. We don't have um, any limitations on who can come together to share best practices, to share their knowledge, whether it is uh, academic based or traditional in order to meet the needs for um, the particular theme we have in mind. Uh, we've been able to find a nexus of interest around several themes to date, um, though we are now embarking on an effort to address all the SDGs at once, uh, science for the SDGs and that is in development currently, but we've already been able to address uh, key science issues related to food security, freshwater security, coastal vulnerability, mountains as sentinels of change, Arctic observing and science for sustainability, climate predictability, and intra-regional linkages. And we're now working on <clears throat> the food, water, energy nexus and urbanizing and urbanized areas, as well as transformation to sustainability. So, <clears throat> We work together um, as organizations uh, that conduct our own business models to be able to bring together these organizations, requiring the partnership of a variety of institutions. They all uh, come together in a universe that is able to support these um, consortia of natural science, social science, and stakeholders. And as you'll see in this figure here, we also have a ring around these that is the information commons, because something that all of our members and partners also um, have subscribed to is the idea of open data, you know, really creating an expectation of transparency across these sectors and um, ensuring that the information that is gathered through these projects is available for reuse and reinterpretation in other areas. So uh, this is the universe that we currently support and with Future Earth as one of our boundary organizations. Um, we are on the governing council for Future Earth, um, but the incredible number of stakeholders and experts that Future Earth is in contact with represents um, an aspect of our knowledge network that is able to uh, create a legacy beyond the initial funding. Uh, we've had projects that have come to completion and through interaction have created uh, new efforts with private philanthropic funding through Future Earth 
that create a longer term legacy in the community to be able to extend this beyond the typical grant or contracting timeframes. So as we continue to engage with other organizations and address sustainable development goals and other critical scientific needs, we are now uh, expanding our uh, interaction to include partnerships with organizations that whose primary focus is in the health sciences or engineering and management sciences. And we also recognize the need for um, inclusive vocabulary when working with these organizations. For instance, um, ensuring that people understand that social sciences in our context includes the humanities as um, an accepted uh, scientific contributor to the transformation that's necessary at this time. And to enable that open data policy plan that we have, we are now engaging very meaningfully with the international uh, bodies and implementers of information sciences, computer sciences, data management uh, to make that a reality. And this will continue to diversify and expand to address these critical needs. And we do that through enhanced conversation, collaboration, and innovation, really trying to find those uh, partners who are open to collaboration, who are willing to have the conversation to engage outside of their um, sometimes domestic, state, or lo local um, perspectives for the betterment of their own people. Uh, it's really the value added of this approach that makes it so um, attractive to all of these different bodies. So to realize this, we have what we call the virtual pot, and it's made up of a number of contributions that do not necessarily cross national bounds unless that's the mandate of the organization and i think this pot is what makes us attractive to some organizations what we are doing is essentially um, aligning the interests without prescription and without requiring organizations to work outside of their typical business model um, we are synchronizing contemporaneous funding across national boundaries so even a small contribution by a developing economy could see leverage of 20 times over for their contribution into a project to uh, support their own personnel or their own academics or stakeholders they will have the uh, investment by other countries since every project must be multinational, they must be a multilateral agreement of a minimum of three countries. So they're leveraging that minimum of two other countries' investment in the project. Large investments such as um, are put forward by the European Commission or large federal agencies, they can be synced into this process because our timing is flexible we don't require calls for proposals to go out at a specific time. Um, we have that uh, fluidity to be able to make the most of those large scale investments. And as I mentioned, the pledged contributions can come at any level. So one of our organizations is a state organization within Brazil. Um, we can partner with uh, consortia of industry or with a small business. It's really about the development of what we call an organizational annex that allows each um, investor in a call to explain their interest in the umbrella theme, to discuss the eligibility for those resources, uh, provide a programmatic contact, and um, communicate to their audience this opportunity um, there's very low administrative overhead in this scenario, so we do not impose a burden upon organizations that would be joining us in a call. You're not required to be a member of the forum to participate in one of our collaborative research actions. All that's needed is that organizational annex. 
and there's the opportunity for all investors to shape the call text and the implementation plan. We're working with one of our partners, ICSU, um, and Future Earth as a boundary organization on a meeting in Sao Paulo in November, the STI forum for the SDGs, because we recognize even with this level of flexibility, we do impose a merit review process to the projects that are funded. And there are some organizations that rely on a board or other review process to make their funding decisions. So we're looking for other flexible partnership frameworks to develop to enable those philanthropic, private foundation, or um, high net earner resources to be able to come together and to be able to partner in a Belmont Forum call or other global call um, so that we can continue this alignment process towards um, meeting these critical goals. And, and just in closing here, um, just wanted to indicate that we are striving to meet those global challenges through inclusive research so that the legacy of these projects, the knowledge exchange can continue far beyond the grant award contract or other phase uh, through the development of sort of a community ownership that translates that into meaningful policy practice and, um, and communication to others about their successes and lessons learned. So again, thank you, Steve, for this opportunity today, and I will pass the presenter baton back over. Thanks so much, Erica. It's really uh, impressive as a, an innovative approach to um, what is usually a major challenge of creating meaningful relationships between these two different communities, those who are recipients and those who are um, providing the funding, something that's often criti criticized as a, a power imbalance. Um, so I really appreciate um, the perspective you've provided. It seems that all of our uh, discussions today are addressing this uh, question of um, what Marcos uh, put from uh, funding uh, to financing, how to um, think about uh, the financial options and the ecosystem options in a much bigger uh, context rather than, um, oh, we have this legacy foundation amount of money and that's what we're going to allocate. It's about how to create um, the ecosystem for financing uh, the change and thinking about that as a need for capacity development, which was highlighted by Wings and Benjamin, um, and uh, from changing the to the um, sort of systems perspective of Marcos and Erica, thinking about the relationships between communities and how to have an opportunity-driven um, sort of perspective of bringing in new donors to this uh, general uh, theme that they've been developing. I'd like to uh, invite others in the uh, participants here to bring up their own um, thoughts or uh, opportunities. It seems to me that there's an enormous amount of uh, a need here for these innovative approaches uh, in terms of some action research that could be done since they all value a multi-stakeholder engagement and on the ground action um, and different ways for being able to uh, develop uh, these um, uh, approaches with a concerted uh, sort of disciplined research approach. I'm thinking of uh, the different national fora that uh, Marcos talked about. It would be very valuable to have some uh, cons some comparisons uh, about those fora and how to develop them and integrate some leading knowledge about partnerships across these types of um, complex uh, domains that are being developed and uh, trying to do some experiments with uh, testing different hypotheses about how these can be advanced more effectively. So um, moving on to uh, people in our audience, if you would like to um, share a question or some uh, thoughts, uh, you can 
um, indicate in the uh, question box under uh, the uh, on the left hand side of your screen. Um, let's uh, try Lydia. You had a question um, uh, that you were looking for some more information from Marcos, I believe. Lydia, if you'd like to uh, light up your own uh, microphone, um, we can let you um, ask your question directly. Uh, if you would like to do that, Lydia, can you? Uh, let's see. Can you try using your microphone? Are you able to hear me? Yes, okay. we can. Uh, Please go ahead. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, when Marcus was the, uh, sharing with us on the way forward on now, uh, how we gonna go forward on the SDGs, he mentioned that he would share with us some websites where we can be able to get uh, more information on what they are working on as UNDP. Sure. Okay, um, I would thank you. I glad you could share with us so that we can take it up from there. It's Steve, if I write on Marcus. the chat, if I write to the website on the chat, will everybody see? They will indeed. Okay. So I will do that so it's much easier. It's a series of websites, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to put it out there and, um, and people can see. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank uh, you. One more thing I wanted to find out is um, we are trying to look for funding for women economic empowerment and the eradication of uh, poverty in East African region. And this will require us to have $2.5 million for a project that is going to run for three years. Uh, is there a way this can be directly funded under the Future Earth project? And how can we get funding for this? Well, I'm just wondering um, uh, whether, uh, let's see, um, these uh, the people here are not um, applicants or are not, um, well, uh, Future Earth, or um, I'm sorry, um, Erica does have a process for receiving requests, but I think it comes from your partner organizations, does it not, Erica? Uh, and Marcos, uh, you might have some thoughts about what's evolving in East Africa since you mentioned that and whether there's new um, opportunities um, if uh, Benjamin if you have any thoughts about um, the capacity in East Africa that's evolving here um, you might add something as well I'll just let you see um, Erica do you have anything to add about um, how if I've understood it right you you, you fund uh, people who are working with you as partners too so Lydia, uh, one of our partner organizations is START, uh, which has a very strong engagement in Africa. Uh, we also have members and developing members in the region from national research foundations. Uh, we recognize the need to build funding capacity for African researchers and also um, encourage African leadership in projects. Uh, so we are going to be having a meeting at UNEA 3 in Nairobi in December uh, to engage with African organizations and with um, the greater scientific community. So at that time, we'll be discussing the possibility of an African regional call for proposals. So I think it'll be important during that meeting to get uh, the priorities uh, if women economic empowerment in East Africa is a critical priority, that needs to be voiced um, at that meeting or through our partnership with START and other members in the region uh, so that a call for proposals can be put out and um, applications can be made for money. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Benjamin, uh, can you give us an update on what's happening specifically in the East Africa region as an example? in WINGS members. Whoops, we've got to get your audio going, Benjamin. Uh, Sorry, can yeah. you hear me okay. now? Yeah. Well, no, I, I mean, it's, um, 
Yes, it's a, it's a bit a specific question, so I, I, I'm not really able to answer. But what I can say is that, yes, in East Africa, there is a, a very lively uh, domestic philanthropy sector, in particular from the community philanthropy field. Uh, and well, there are organizations such as the Kenya Community Development Foundation who play this role of uh, uh, gathering local uh, uh, resources and, 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 and trying to pull that to support communities. Uh, whether it well, there are some funds coming from outside, some funds coming from the national level, and also communities, uh, communities funds also. So the KCDF is an interesting example of uh, support organization in, in Kenya, and there are other. And I know that the sector is developing, and it's also, I think, uh, if I, I'm not mistaken, uh, one of the countries where there is a SDG philanthropy platform. But then for a specific project, uh, I think it would require to have a, a, a specific uh, uh, research on who are the potential funders for that. Okay. Marcos, I'm wondering if you might um, give us more of an idea exactly what's happening with the SDG uh, platform in uh, East Africa to take this opportunity from Lydia's question to understand how you're going about developing the platform in East Africa. Um, how do you bring it together? How does it, who does it involve? Um, what is, is sort of direction is it taking? Sure. So, so we have a, we have a, SDG philanthropy platforms about 10 countries around the world in our continents. Um, in East Africa, we have it in Kenya. It's actually the oldest running one. The process is very simple, right? We, um, we use the, the United Nations um, convening capacity, right? Uh, which I think uh, when it comes down to convening around the SDGs, I think the UN has a tremendous amount of credibility as well as a reputation to be an event convener. So what are we doing is we, we've we developed a series of uh, tools, you know, mapping tools and, um, you know, uh, workshop development tools where you actually map all philanthropic um, um, organizations in Kenya. You've mapped what they do. You've mapped what the government is doing vis-a-vis -vis the SDGs. Um, and then you're starting to bring people together to see the results of those mapping exercises. Um, our experiences is a continuous process, a systematic and permanent process of convening around the specifically mappings or specifically thematic exercises. Um, builds trust. So, for example, <clears throat> right now the government of Kenya has actually recognized the value of philanthropy and actually has allowed philanthropy to be recognized as a stakeholder in its SDG implementation. Uh, the Kenya Philanthropy Forum was created, was a spun out as this dialogue that we created uh, um, and we still manage in Kenya. And now, and now, two years later, what are we starting to see is a series of collective actions. So different players, philanthropy and, uh, and government and, and, and business coming together, you know, either to, you know, create a sub platform, if you want, to advance early childhood development in Kenya. And that includes both project level as well as policy work, or to create a specific set of interventions in policy in the Turkana district in Kenya. So all of those things were spur 18 months on and 24 months on from this general dialogue um, that was created in a permanent basis. Those platforms are also serving as accelerating processes. So for example, in Ghana, where we have one, um, the global uh, platform for education, which is not run by UNDP, I think it's called that, but the global education fund or something like that, they decided that they want to invest in Kenya, they want to enter Kenya. Um, so they approached us by saying, look, rather than trying to figure out what is going on in education in Kenya, you have a platform in place. Would you please, please do one of your mappings specifically on the um, education sector? you know, and then help us with a couple of convenings to try to generate a consensus and alignment on education. So when we come into Kenya, we are able to decide where to put our resources that is aligned and complementary with what is going on at national level. Those are exactly the hypothesis what we had three years ago when we created the SDG philanthropy platform to, to provide those functions, to spur those functions. Now, just to be very clear, the platform is not a funding platform, right? Inside of the platform that I'm funding 
organizations, but the platform itself does not give funding um, beyond, you know, what we call catalytically small amount of monies to spur, you know, innovation around bringing people together. So, as I said, this is what was going on in Kenya and Ghana. We are in Zambia, we are in Colombia, Brazil, India, China, Indonesia. Um, and I actually have um, a large number of countries um, asking for this me mechanism to be replicated, not just with philanthropy, but more and more with actually business and civil society at the same time. And one of the websites, oh, that's marvelous, uh... one of the websites that I just mm -hmm. added, the, the second website that I added there is the website of the STG philanthropy uh, uh, work. Marvelous. Um, so it strikes me, I can see, um, you know, part of the purpose of these webinars is to identify potential connections, uh, bringing about our own alignment. Um, I can see that uh, with uh, Benjamin, uh, it'd be great to get research centers connected more into future Earth, for example. And the um, with Marcos, it would be great for us to be able to um, get the uh, platforms, uh, the SDG national platforms involved in the SDG transformation forum. And certainly, um, Erica, you've been presenting a range of um, really innovative approaches to bring together people across traditional funding and funder grantee divides. So um, a lot of uh, very interesting possibilities here. So I'd like to thank everyone for participating in this webinar. And we will be having another webinar in um, uh, next week. I would like to, um, I will just uh, copy my own um, <laughs> chat menu. It will be on the measurement challenge. Um, and we'll be having a great number of uh, three people who will be um, talking with us uh, next week. They will be um, Eva Furman, who's with uh, the who's been taking a lead in measuring the um, uh, impact the SDG taking on the SDG impact measurement assessment issue for the UN. Um, Michael Quinn Patton, he's the founder and CEO of Utilization Focused Evaluation, but he's really well known as somebody working on systemic evaluation issues and uh, has developed developmental evaluation as a particular approach. He's the former head of the International um, or the Evaluation Association, or the American Evaluation Association, and Fred Carden, who has comes from the International Development Research Center in Canada in his history. Uh, he's now working independently and has developed uh, the uh, particular tool methodology of outcome mapping. And he's been uh, known for very adventuresome approaches to uh, move from the traditional input output type of assessment, which is fine if you're working in products, but it just doesn't work very well with transformation. So join us next week, next Tuesday, um, June 17th, uh, of course, different uh, times in different locations. Um, but we will be looking forward to you to join us there. Um, David. Thanks, Steve. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. And we have two questions uh, we didn't get a chance uh, to get to. We're at the uh, bottom of the hour, so we'll record those. And I uh, will get back to you uh, via email. And thanks, everybody, for joining today. I uh, hope you have a great rest of your day and speak again soon. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.